So, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Buenas tardes. I am very sorry indeed that I can't be with you this afternoon in the museum for this remarkable symposium. Uh, I'm doubly sorry because I know that sitting in the auditorium there are uh, quite a number of old friends of mine, um, friends and colleagues I would have loved to see again. Um, it would be so great to see you to, to catch up um, and talk about happier times before this wretched pandemic turned all our lives upside down. Let's just hope there'll be another opportunity to do precisely that. To friends and colleagues in the museum and to anyone participating online, I would like to offer um, a different kind of apology. Um, please forgive me if from time to time as I'm speaking, um, it's very obvious that I'm consulting my notes as I speak. Um, I'm doing this for a very specific reason. As you know, I'm talking this afternoon about an interview that I conducted with uh, the late Valentin von Nissa uh, way back in 1989. The Baron had a very particular distinctive way of speaking that was all his own. His command of English was excellent. His remarks were elegantly phrased to the point and very often witty and amusing. I wanted to be able to quote for you exactly what he said to me um, in his own words, rather than just uh, paraphrasing the content of our conversation. And in that way, I hope to be able to convey for you uh, a more vivid and more accurate picture of this um, extraordinary and extraordinarily charming man, the way he really was, which in the end is one of the main aims of my lecture this afternoon. So I'll be looking at my notes and I'll be quoting what he said to me. So I'm talking about an interview that I conducted with the Baron at the Villa Favorita in Lugano, um, his home in Switzerland in 1989. And both the interview itself and the precise date, the 28th of July in that year, are still engraved on my memory. The next day, he and I were due to attend the uh, private view of the exhibition that's just been mentioned, Expressionism, the masterpieces from the Thyssen-Bornemisza collection. That was a show that I had the privilege uh, and indeed the fun uh, of devising and curating. The masterpieces in question were being displayed in the beautiful galleries the Baron's father had added to the villa in the 1930s, um, not originally as an exhibition space, but in order to house his own collection of old master paintings. And I hope that what you're seeing on the screen in the auditorium is an aerial photograph uh, of the villa. And if you can see along the top of the building, uh, disappearing behind the trees, that's the gallery running along all the way down and uh, out of the picture at the far left hand side is the public entrance and the public come in and they buy their tickets and they climb the stairs and then they come into the galleries um, that way. So I knew that Expressionism and these works in particular were especially close to Baron Thiessen's heart. I was also conscious of the fact that this was the first exhibition devoted solely to the German Expressionist paintings from his collection. For his sake, I wanted everything to be exactly right. I was also very much looking forward to meeting him. Unfortunately for him, the day had got off to a very bad start. He decided to fly in from Spain early that morning in time for a string of appointments in Lugano. That had meant getting up at some ridiculously antisocial hour. 
When he got to Madrid airport, he found that his private jet had been wrecked by a fuel tanker, one wing completely crushed while standing on the tarmac. It had taken a while for the Spanish authorities to find him a substitute, and he was terribly late by the time he arrived. I knew he had an action-packed day ahead of him. Surely, I thought, he must be feeling tired and frustrated. And yet, when he entered the room, it was as if none of these things mattered. Later, I'll describe what I think I learned from this encounter with one of the world's most formidable collectors. That is what I learned about him as a person. For the moment, let me just say, I was immediately captivated by his warmth, his friendliness. He relaxed into our conversation as if he had all the time in the world. Uh, to my surprise, he seemed to relish the chance to just sit and chat, um, rather than fretting about his next appointment. But what surprised me even more was that the story he told in interview was rather different from anything I had expected. The Baron had already been interviewed some 10 years earlier by Wolfhard Dreger, the editor of the Swiss art periodical Du. Then in 1983, he had published a relatively brief article of his own called German Expressionism, A Personal Choice. It first appeared in the journal Apollo and then got reprinted um, several times. I had imagined, worried even, that what I was about to hear might just turn out to be more of the same. <laughs> Far from it. I got the feeling that for once he was really enjoying the opportunity of letting his hair down, going off piste. Not only that, he was clearly determined to take me with him. For whatever reason, he'd evidently decided to trust this complete stranger sitting there in his study, tape recorder at the ready. I knew that the Baron had inherited only one part of his father's remarkable collection of old masters, and that a number of important items had passed to other family members. When Baron Heinrich Thyssenbornemisza died in 1947, his son, Hans Heinrich, had felt it his duty to try to reunite as many as possible of the works his father had owned. But he had a further agenda. He didn't just want to turn the clock back and restore the collection to something like its former glory. He was also determined to improve it based on his own judgment of quality and his growing appetite for collecting. Everything was done with the aim of improving the collection, he said to me. That's why I started collecting. With time, his ambitions expanded. For one thing, he wanted to add works by those well-known masters who were still missing from the collection. But he also wanted to acquire better works by artists who were already represented. This prompted me to ask him whether he ever sold pictures in order to buy other, better ones. He laughed. <laughs> yes, he said, sometimes I do. But you know, it's not a very lucrative occupation. Beside which you always sell the ones you shouldn't have sold. It's not a clever thing to do. However, he confessed that what he regretted most were what he called the things you miss. By this, he meant the works he had the opportunity to buy, but for one reason or another had failed to do so. Astonishingly, his father's collection had been acquired in little more than 15 years, mostly during the 1930s. In comparison, by the time of our interview, the Baron had already been collecting for nearly 40 years. At first, only old masters following in his father's footsteps, then to an ever greater extent, modern paintings, which Heinrich Giesen had disdained. So you see, he said to me, you need not only money, but also time. I, I have been lucky. In conversation, he stressed that his priority was, above all, quality. But the topic 
he returned to again and again in our interview, was one of passion. Love and passion, he insisted, were essential in order to create what he called a real collection. What, I asked, did he mean by real? His response was emphatic. For him, a real collection had to be something independent, a living entity. It should also be self-supporting, which meant attracting a large, constantly changing and paying public. He firmly believed that works of art should be accessible to all. In the end, he said, my, the painter didn't paint his pictures for me, the individual owner, but for his environment, for his contemporaries, effectively for anyone who wanted to see them. He was scathing about another equally well-known Swiss collection, although he was too discreet to name it. I didn't name it either, but I knew perfectly well which one he meant. I saw it, he said in aggrieved tones. There's nobody there. The Swiss don't want it, so they don't go there. But I can sympathize. I wouldn't want it either. It hasn't the love and passion. Wanting to make his own collection accessible to a much wider audience was just one of the factors that led to the creation of the present Museo Nacional Tissenbornemisse. He emphasized that 10 times as many people would have the chance to see his works of art in Madrid than would have been the case in Lugano. This, he told me, had been an important consideration when it came to agreeing the transfer of the pictures to Spain an agreement which at the time of our interview had only very recently been signed. His hunch that in the longer term, Switzerland was perhaps the wrong place for the public display of his collection had been proved right a decade earlier. In 1979, over 100 of his carefully chosen modern European and American paintings had been loaned to Australia. That touring exhibition was initially held to mark the inauguration of the new Art Gallery of Western Australia in Perth. In the space of a fortnight, it attracted as many visitors as the Villa Favorita in Lugano could boast in an entire year. Being free to decide whether to lend or not to lend was one of the many advantages he enjoyed as a private collector, entitled to dispose of his property in any way he pleased, if you owned pictures, you could do what you liked with them. Exhibit them, lend them, sell them, keep them locked in a bank vault. If you felt like it, you could even chop them up and burn them. The Baron pooh-poohed the idea that any sane person might choose to destroy a work of art. That, he thought, would simply be an act of vandalism. On the other hand, if you wanted to lend paintings, or even give them away. There was nothing stopping you. You didn't need to ask anyone's permission. And he did, indeed, give paintings away. In a remarkable act of generosity, at its formal opening, the Baron presented the new gallery in Perth with an important painting by the German expressionist Ernst Ludwig Kirchner. He insisted that this was a picture that belonged in a museum rather than in private hands. Although he confessed, I shall miss it nonetheless. He also compared his situation as a private collector with some of the world's great museums and galleries. He even singled out a few of them. These included the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth, for example, or the Cleveland Museum, which he clearly admired and to which he even sold works on occasion, but which he also regarded as a rival. Such museums, often faced obstacles that prevented them from building up the kind of collection he himself saw in his mind's eye. Key works had often not been choices, but legacies or donations, which in many cases had determined the character, the thrust of the collection. Even where it was a matter of deliberate choices, often those decisions were based not on the taste or judgment of an individual, but on an acquisitions policy um, determined by a committee. On that question, the Baron was adamant. 
no matter what the circumstances, that wasn't the way to create a real collection, that is, by committee. Moreover, committee decisions were sometimes reached only after lengthy discussions, and the process became even lengthier when major fundraising uh, proved necessary. If it turned into a race to acquire some exceptional piece, a collector like the Baron, under no obligation to consult anyone else, and with funds at his disposal, was nearly always better placed to move swiftly and decisively. This was the context in which we found ourselves talking about one of the most important works in the collection, the painting Metropolis, Die Großstadt, uh, by George Gross. With an impeccable provenance, it had come on the market quite unexpectedly, the previous owner finding himself obliged to sell several, several major pieces in order to raise funds. I remarked that this was a painting any great museum in the world would love to buy. The Baron leaned forward as if about to share a confidence. But you know, he said, they could have done. It was for sale. They, they could have bought it, but... He didn't finish his sentence, but his meaning was clear. Compared with him, museums were often not quick enough or agile enough to prevent major items from just slipping through their fingers. An acquisitions committee might also have other agendas. These might include practical considerations like maintaining the balance of the collection. On this question, I have to say the Baron was not entirely consistent. Although he maintained that filling gaps should not be the first priority, he confessed that he had fretted long and hard over the lack of an important painting by August Macke, declaring, you, you cannot have a German expressionist collection without Macke. By the time of our interview, there were in fact several works by Macke in the collection, including a beautiful little picture of three promenaders. The Baron had acquired that painting as early as 1962, but it was in poor condition and needed extensive restoration. So he was clearly delighted to have been able to purchase much more recently, in, in 1988 in fact, uh, just a year before our exhibition opened, a work by Macke of real importance. This was the circus painting, the kind of dramatic subject that is extremely rare in Macke's oeuvre. Here, a bareback rider has fallen from her horse and is being tended by an anxious group of acrobats. But the work is also important, not just for stylistic, but also for historical reasons. It documents one of the most fruitful periods of the artist's all too short creative life, a 10 month stay at Hildefingen in Switzerland from September 1913 to June 1914, during which many of his defining works were created. So far, my conversation with Baron had centered largely on the expressionist paintings in the collection. I hadn't intended asking him which were his favorites. Nevertheless, this topic seemed to come up quite naturally all by itself. I remarked on the quality and significance of paintings by Lionel Feininger, whose works formed and still form an important element of the collection. My companion sparked up immediately. I love Feininger very much, one of the finest paints. I, I have a special affection for him. A particular favorite of his and mine was this small ski, uh, seascape dream across the river. As I listened, I was struck by inc how incredibly well informed and knowledgeable he was. Without prompting, he could remember all sorts of details, not only about finding it himself or the subject matter of the picture, he could also name previous owners, even individual restorers who had worked on his paintings at one time or another. Undoubtedly, I thought this was someone blessed with a highly retentive memory, at least for those things that really interested him. 
Talking about this painting provo provoked some illuminating reflections on the part of its owner. Feininger came first to Hamburg when he was still very young, the Baron said. He was Jewish, you knew that? So in the 1930s, he had to leave after so many years in Germany. We talked about the artist's feelings on being forced to turn his back on a country he regarded as home, where he'd made practically his entire career. And we were struck, both of us, by the subtle but profound sense of nostalgia that pervades the painting. Nostalgia for a lost homeland was something Baron Hans Heinrich could immediately relate to. His own father, Heinrich Thyssen von Emissa, had fled Hungary and moved to the Netherlands in the 1920s. Unlike his brother Fritz Thyssen, Heinrich was no admirer of the Nazis. By 1932, he could foresee that Hitler's rise to power in Germany would probably end in war, which was likely to engulf Holland as well. In that year, he moved his collection to Switzerland and bought the Villa Favorita. By 1933, he himself had emigrated once again and settled in Lugano. This, the Baron admitted, had unforeseen advantages as far as he was concerned. The new galleries in the villa were finished before bro war broke out in 1939 and were already in use. Still in his twenties during the war, he had constantly before his eyes an old, mast old master collection to rival that of any major museum. This, he said, was what helped him to develop rapidly his understanding of art as well as his remarkable feeling for quality. The painting we've been talking about, uh, Finding a Dream Across the River, had been purchased through Marlborough Fine Art, the London gallery founded after the war by two Austrian emigres, Frank Lloyd and Harry Fisher. Fisher's son Wolfgang subsequently joined his father in London. It was Wolfgang Fisher who encouraged the Baron to further extend his collection of modern paintings in new and unexpected ways. Baron Hans Heinrich had, in his own words, loved very much the exhibition of Neue Sachlichkeit, the new objectivity, which he had seen at the Hayward Gallery in London in 1978. Not only did Wolfgang Fischer prove to be a mine of information about artists such as Otto Dix and Christian Schad, who were strongly represented in that exhibition, he also facilitated the purchase of works by these and other German painters of the 1920s. In this way, some of the most important examples of what became known as magical realism entered the Tissenborn Emissa collection. These two were included in our 1989 Lugano exhibition. In that context, they sat rather oddly, I thought, alongside masterpieces by nearly all the major expressionists, paintings that were, for the most part, anything but realistic. However, I kept my opinion to myself. I found it a striking aspect of the Baron's personality that for all his wealth, he seemed totally uninterested in posing as the great I am. As in everything else, he was gracious and indeed generous in acknowledging the debt he owed to dealers and experts like Fisher, on whose advice he so often relied and whom he regarded as his friends. But in the area of expressionism and German painting more generally, undoubtedly the most important of these experts was the auctioneer, gallerist and collector Roman Norbert Ketterer. Ketterer had a profound effect on the development of the collection. In our interview, the Baron was unstinting in his praise, saying, he gave very good advice, difficult to describe its value. Kesserer was the person who helped to focus and guide the Baron's determination to seek out and buy what he called only the best paintings of the best period. This was the most important criterion, no matter whether it was a major figure like Kirchner or a less expensive or less well-known artist. Baron Thiessen became one of Ketterer's most valued clients. 
Sometimes he would buy from the gallery the dealer had established in Campione d'Italia, just across the lake from the Villa Favorita on the Italian side of the border with Switzerland. But Kessler's move to Italy meant that from time to time he was in need of money and had to sell a painting from his own personal collection. On such occasions, he would phone the Baron. By now, the two men had become good friends. Between them, they devised a rather idiosyncratic manner of bidding for pictures. Each would write down on a slip of paper how much they thought a particular painting was worth. Their agreement was that when the figures were revealed, it would always be the sum stipulated by Ketterer that would be the actual selling price. However, this system didn't always work to his advantage since the price Ketterer had proposed often turned out to be lower than what his client would have been willing to pay. I asked whether these days the Baron felt confident in his own judgments rather than relying on the opinions of others. Interestingly, after so many years, he was quick to single out Ketterer as one of the few people I still ask for advice. At the time of our meeting, he just bought from him yet another important painting, one that I was delighted to be able to include in our exhibition. This was Kirchner's landscape entitled Curving Bay. I'm sorry. In the first complete catalogue of the artist's paintings, the picture had been dated 1917. That date had always struck me as implausible. At that time, Kirchner was ill and had been invalided out of the German army. He was also living in a hut on top of a mountain in Switzerland, a strange environment, I thought, in which to paint a tropical looking bather's scene. Although Kirchner had created several comparable works between 1910 and 1914, if the date 1917 were correct, Curving Bay would have been the only such depiction painted during that period. Much more likely, I thought, was that this was an immediately pre-war painting, painted perhaps in the summer of 1914, on the very eve of the outbreak of the First World War. The date is important. When I mentioned this new acquisition to the Baron, he responded immediately. It depicted a landscape he knew well. But this is Feynman, he explained. You know, where, where you look across to Kiel. He too was struck, as I had been, by the ecstatic, but at the same time ominous mood of the painting. It looked as if the artist were painting not what he saw before his eyes, but rather some kind of cosmic, even apocalyptic vision with its blood red sun and curving horizon, the entire globe seemed to be convulsed by this sinister sunset. To me, it seemed to be announcing what the Austrian writer Karl Kraus would later call the last days of mankind. It was time to draw our conversation to a close. As I did so, I reflected on the personality of this remarkable man I had been happily chatting to I had no doubt that he could drive a hard bargain, nor that he was an astute businessman. He was also a highly discerning connoisseur. But my overwhelming impression had more to do with his niceness, his kindness, his generosity. I've already mentioned how he gave an important painting uh, to the Art Gallery of Western Australia. But he was generous in other ways. During one of my trips to Lugano, there was a minor crisis. One member of the team and her family had unexpectedly been made homeless, a contract for the accommodation of the family having been abruptly terminated by the landlord. Where were they to live? In the Baron's mind, there was no question. He offered them the use of one of the other smaller houses on the estate to tide them over until they could make more suitable arrangements. And other members of his staff could tell similar stories. Emile Bossard, collection's hugely experienced chief conservator, often travelled with his employer. In one of our many conversations, he let drop a telling remark. You know, he said to me, he's such a nice guy. Sometimes when we're walking out to the plane, 
I have the feeling that he's going to reach out his hand and carry my bag for me. He was intellectually generous too. On the evening of our private view, the guests were already assembling in the gardens of the Villa Favorita. Our host was just beginning his introductory speech when he spotted Mr. Ketterer arrive. Immediately, he interrupted what he was saying and thrust out a welcoming arm in his direction. Der Held, he exclaimed warmly and for everyone to hear. Here comes the hero. And he had a nice sense of humour. I was about to turn off the tape recorder, but the Baron seemed happy to continue chatting. I said how sorry I was to hear that his plane had been in an accident and hoped that no one was hurt. Well, it could have been much worse, he replied. If it had been in the air, that would have been different. He smiled broadly. As a result, I found myself flying in a very comfortable plane, the first time in my life. I wasn't sure whether I believed this. Even so, I ventured, it sounds as if the damage was considerable. I hope they're going to pay for it. The smile grew even broader. Well, he replied, they have to pay. I think they will be insured, or I can always not send the pictures to Spain. So, there you have it. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you. I don't know what is normally done about uh, questions but uh, or discussion, but I am going to stay online uh, for a bit. So I'll be taking part in the um, roundtable discussion that follows on um, immediately after this talk. So perhaps either now or then, by all means, ask me questions, although I can't promise that I'll know the answers. Thank you.